with you for this lecture in just a few minutes. Anyone who's out there listening, hope you're having a good day. All my tabs in a row. Sometimes you've got to get your ducks in a row, and sometimes you have to get your tabs in a row. Five. Time to start. Start my recording. Um, go to my remote. G'day everybody. <laughs> Welcome to the third lecture for Comp 2300 slash 6300. Um, I can see there's folks 
on the team, <laughs> listening to me. Oh, you're all there. So nice to have you joining me for these lectures live online. What I'm going to do is just at the team and say, join me in the chat. <laughs> We'll see if we get anybody joining in. Give it another couple of seconds before we get into the real, the real important stuff in this lecture today. I've got, I know I've got a bunch of people watching me on Microsoft Stream. Thank you so much, my folks, for joining me. I know I've got some folks um, watching me on YouTube and a bunch of Twitchers watching me on Twitch. Really enjoy having folks on Twitch and, and YouTube. Um, they're really great services. And, and you know, there's a, there's a lot of wonderful streamers doing gaming content, doing music content, and people doing teaching. And I'm really happy to join this um, kind of public community of, of folks getting out there, talking about stuff that's interesting to them and interesting to an audience as well. It's a kind of pure sort of form of performance, right? The, it's like busking. Your audience has to has to bother tuning in. Now I've got my my mug. I've got my coffee. I've got my computer. We've got folks online. I think we're ready to go. We're ready to rock. So I'm going to switch myself to small mode, just while we have a chat. Um, a, a few little official details. There's no huge things to remember this week uh, for everyone in comp 2300, 6300. You will know that you have your second lab this week. This is the first lab that really has content. Um, the first week lab was really about setting up your computer and getting a little bit of familiarity with the tools which we'll be using this semester. Those tools, as you will remember, are VS Code, the comp 2300 VS Code extension, the build tool chain, which is included with the extension that installs it for you, the micro bit which you plug into your computer. And so what we saw last week was 400 people all with wonderful and unique computers bringing them in and we found every type of error that it was possible to imagine <laughs> with our system. Um, on Friday we released a slightly updated version of the extension which the main difference was it would just facilitate getting the build tool chain if we had any updates to it. Um, there were some folks who needed to do an update because they had this very new v2.2 micro bit. Um, but I think that that has been solved now. You can use the, if you can just make sure you've got the latest build tool chain, everything will work. If you're on your computer and everything seems to be working, then you're fine. So you don't need to, you don't need to change anything if, if everything is working. So we're, we're happy with that situation. Um, I'm going to, Start giving the lecture because we've got a, a fairly, a fairly chunky topic today. ALU operations. What did we do last week? We got through some of the basics of digital logic in the electronics domain, connected it to logic in maths through the Boolean algebra talk. And we got to the point where you could start to see that instead of dealing with algebraic operations, we could turn these into circuits in electronics and use them to do calculations for us. And I think I had a slide up towards the end of, of the lecture on Thursday where um, there was a ripple carry adder, there was some other logic, uh, logic gates to do um, the basic logic operations and or an XOR. And we had these in a little circuit so that you could actually select which of those operators was going to be active to take um, one, two bits of input, the two inputs, either add them together, and them together, or them together, XOR them together. And then we had an operator um, to a kind of controlling circuit that would select which one of those operators was active. And when you put those things together, uh, we talked about this idea that you would have an arithmetic and logic unit within a CPU which basically does just as we were talking about just then. Those, this concept that um, you're taking two numbers represented as 
either a high or low voltage on an electric wire, on a number of wires to represent each binary digit, and we're using a, a circuit of logic gates to combine those things. That's what an ALU will do. Now we get to understand from the other direction, the software direction, how do we control the ALU in a CPU using programming? And we'll talk about what we're going to do. But first, first a tour of your micro bit. Tour of your micro bit. Where's a micro bit? There's probably one around here somewhere. Oh yeah, here's one. I've got a couple around this desk. Um, and here's a huge picture of a micro bit. You've seen this picture before. There's, a, there's the micro bit. Now this is just a really exciting computer. I'm just gonna, just to um, <laughs> compare for you guys, this is the one we used last year. This is called a, a discovery board, or a disco board for short. And the micro bit is just so much cuter. Look at that. Who would want this chunky old thing? This is the way to go. Micro bits for the win. So the, the discovery board was really cool. It has a lot of great features. Uh, and a really interesting, powerful processor. And in fact, the microbit has the same kind of processor as we were using last year, a Cortex M4 processor. So we're not going to look at that anymore. I just wanted to demonstrate this, this difference between these two, two objects. Um, yeah, a few years ago, I, I 3D printed a nice case for my disco board, but I haven't got a, a 3D printed case for a microbit. So if someone in the class, as a special extra assignment for not credit, wanted to design a 3D printed case design, a special Comp 2300 3D printed case design for a micro bit. That would be a cool project. You don't get marks for it though, it's just for fun. So your micro bit, it's got some stuff on it. You know, you can see, you probably looked at it and thought, what are all these things? On the front, you've mainly got two big buttons. You can probably identify those. And on the back of it, there's another button for some reason. We're not sure why that's there. Then also on the front, you've got these little LEDs. These little squares or rectangles actually are light. Um, and in this course, you're gonna use these lights to display cool stuff as part of your labs and assessments. We'll get to that soon. You've also got this kind of comb shaped thing down the bottom, all these gold connector things, gold colored, made of copper. And that is actually all these, these little connectors connect to inputs on the CPU of the micro bit doing different things. Well, that one, three volts and grounds, they obviously connected to a power supply. The other ones are connected to your CPU. Then there's also this little smiley face and that's actually wired to your CPU as well. You can use it as an extra button if you're clever. Turning around to the back, we've got some more, more interesting objects. They're, they're quite small and it's sort of, you have to look in the light to really see how much stuff there is on the back of your micro bit. There's this big part in the middle. I'm just gonna use my, this stage, move across to my Wacom tablet. This big part, I'm black, I don't want black, I want green today. Green, this big thing. That's actually a speaker, believe it or not. Someone's just freaking out, extra button. Um, yeah, that's a capacitive button. I didn't put a label on for it, capacitive. Button, no, no idea how to use it. If you can figure it out, then that'll be great this year. The, the exciting thing about this year is because the micro bit is new, we don't really know what's possible with it. At least I know what's possible with it from programming in C or, or uh, MicroPython or something. But when you're just programming from scratch, we don't know what's, what's or, or from bare metal, that means just programming in assembly, we don't know what's possible. Let's talk about the back. We've got the speaker, which looks like a big important thing, but it's, it's big because it has to move some air to actually be heard. Then we've got this thing, the main MCU. What does MCU mean? Another way of putting that could be CPU. I'm just gonna say CPU there in brackets might be a, a, a acronym which is more familiar to you. This is where your code runs. When you run code on your micro bit, that's where it goes. So your ALU is in there, your registers are in there, and some 
flash is in there. Now, the manufacturer or the designer of this particular MCU is a company called Nordic Semiconductor, and this is in the, the type of CPU often called just an NRF52. There are a couple of different NRF something somethings, um, but it's really small. If you can see how small it is, it's, it's small in a fingernail. It's about one centimeter across each side. Uh, someone said they've got a 1.5 micro bit. Now, it's a different kind, unfortunately. We're only dealing with V2.0 micro bits. The 1.5 micro bit doesn't have an NRF52. It's got a different kind of, of MCU there. Sorry. We got this other one here, another part over here, which is also called an MCU. And that's a different, different type. Oops. Your other type of micro, the other MCU over here is actually, all its only job is to, oh, I've lost my, my um, connection here. Its only job is to connect the main MCU to the USB port on the computer. So this one is kind of, it's got an important job, which is to help us load programs on the main MCU. And it also does, does the work of debugging the main MCU. So when you go into debug mode in VS Code, this processor is doing a lot of the work to kind of coordinate moving this one forward and moving VS Code forward, telling it what's going on on the main CPU. So we, it's very typical on a, a board like this that has um, a built-in USB port to actually have it, two MCUs on it, one just for controlling connecting the, the USB to the main MCU, and then the main MCU runs the program you wanna run. Weird, but true. And all of your peripherals, the microphone, the speaker, the IMU, which is sort of a movement sensor, the analog and digital IO, the five by five LED matrix, and the capacitive touch sense button, and the buttons, they're all connected to the main MCU. Now MCU stands for microcontroller unit. It's a bit of a weird term. CPU stands for central processing unit. You probably know that from just general knowledge. And you probably, when you think of a CPU, you probably think of like, oh, Intel or AMD, because you're thinking of the CPU in your laptop or your desktop computer. Um, Marvel Cinematic Universe, indeed, that's if you Google for MCU, that's what you get, Marvel Cinematic Universe. Very good point. So when we think CPU, we often think of, of something in our desktop computer, which might be quite a large part, like the, the CPU in my computer, I don't know I, if I have something to reference, I guess it's about as big as the, the little LED squares, is that right, or is it a bit bigger? I've got an AMD CPU in my, my computer. Many people have an Intel CPU in their computer, but we tend not to have Nordic Semiconductor CPUs in our computer. It's sort of, the, the world of desktops and laptops is a bit different than the world of what we would call embedded electronics or little small low powered devices that still need to have a computer in them. Lots of things have computers in them. Um, your car has multiple. Your fridge has a computer. Your keys have a computer if you've got a smart key ring or something. There's computers everywhere. Yeah, bigger than the LEDs, I think. I've just forgotten how big. You know, I never, never take my heat sink off, right? I've got this massive water-cooled heat sink thing on my, my CPU, and then underneath it, I forget how big it is. So an MCU has a CPU in it. It's kind of a whole computer in one chip. So it has the CPU, it has the RAM on your big computer or your laptop. Your RAM is sometimes on a separate board which plugs into your motherboard and you can change it. Um, if your, your desktop computer or your laptop probably also has some storage, a different part of the computer for storing data. You might have an SSD on a little sub board that plugs into your motherboard or it might just be soldered onto the motherboard of your laptop in a separate part. But the storage for your in an MCU is all inside the chip. Uh, another word which we use these days which is a bit more common is SOC, which stands for system on a chip. System on a chip. And that's the kind of 
it's a similar idea to an MCU, but it generally refers to a somewhat more powerful computer system that might be in your phone or in your Nintendo Switch or in your um, tablet. Or if you have a, a modern laptop of certain types, your laptop would have a system on a chip as well. So the idea of a system on a chip is that it would have, just as we said with the MCU, the CPU is there, the RAM is built into the chip, maybe a GPU is on board as well. Um, so a lot of things on one package. Similarly, the MCU has a lot of things on one package. MCU and system on a chip really mean a similar thing. System on a chip just tends to be computers that we have a screen and that we use for normal everyday work. Whereas MCU tends to be used for embedded systems that don't have a screen. They don't, they don't use Windows or Mac OS. Um, they just run one program and do it well. They might be in your fridge, they might be in your Fitbit, in your smartwatch. And in fact, someone said AirTags. And I think that actually there's a, a Samsung uh, competitor to the AirTags, which I think uses exactly the same MCU as on your micro bit. The NRF52833 is in the, the Samsung Smart Tag or Smart Air or whatever they call it. Um, so this is a little bit about the inside of your micro bit, what you might find when you look at all these things. Of course, there's lots of other stuff here. There's very small parts um, which aren't as important. You know, when you're doing an electronic circuit, you need some other parts to make sure that things get the right voltages or they get a signal that they expect. There's a funny trace out here, this little pattern in the top left corner on the back. This little pattern's actually an antenna for Bluetooth because the NRF52833 does have Bluetooth. So that's the, the, all the stuff on your micro bit or a selection of it. There's also a lot of stuff, a lot of stuff inside here. There's many little peripherals in there and different things which we haven't gone through and things I don't even know about yet because I'm still learning a lot about this MCU. There's a lot of stuff in your micro bit. So the, the thing to know here is there's more than you can master in one semester, definitely more. But as we go through week by week, you're going to understand a lot more about it and you'll certainly understand a lot more at the end of the course than you do now. And one of the ideas of this course is that we use the, the MCU in your micro bit as a kind of case study for how all the computers that you use work. Desktop computers, phones, tablets, servers, um, supercomputers, mostly they work in quite a similar way. Um, compared to the MCU in your micro bit, which is good. It's a particular kind of MCU. This kind does tend to have a lot of similarities with many other types of computers. Now, maybe gotten off track. We're going to talk about instructions. The MCU in it has an ALU. We talked about ALUs last week. And the question is, how are we going to get that ALU to do something? We want it to do something. We have to give it an instruction in order to get the ALU to do something. How do we give it an instruction? We've got to get data from somewhere. And we, we talked last week about this idea of combining a lot of flip-flops together into a register, a 32-bit register. It's 32 of those little flip-flops all in a row. This is a conceptual diagram. If we had to make a real circuit, we probably need some other stuff. Um, but I'm not going to go into great detail because we're not really an electronic design class. We're a computer organization class. We need to know the, how the parts of a computer fit together. I just want to make sure I'm at 100%. Yeah, full screen. Good. And in fact, when you're dealing with the CPU on your MCU, you have lots of registers, lots of places to store little bits of data. So on your micro bit CPU, the C I, I often say micro bit CPU and I mean the CPU inside the MCU, the, the part of it which is a CPU. On the micro bit CPU, you have 16 registers and they're called general purpose registers. They're used for many purposes. And most of them are named with a number, R0 for register zero. That's easy to remember. Sorry, there's black on gray here. It might be a bit hard, a little touch hard to see, um, but it's not too bad. That one's R1, R2, R3, R4, R5, R6, R7, 
all the way up to R12. Then we've got a couple of registers, three extra ones here, which don't have, we tend not to use their number name, we tend to have a special name for them. This one's called SP, LR, and PC. I'm not going to tell you what those things mean yet because we need to, to just consider it to be a mystery until a later, later part of the course. You'll know soon enough the mysteries of SP, LR, and PC. Then we've got one last register. This one's not really, it's not a general purpose register. It's a special register for storing special information. Program status register, PSR. Well, sometimes it's sometimes listed as XPSR in your in VS Code and within the micro bit. So those are the, the registers, the 16 registers plus XPSR. We'll be dealing with those a lot over the next few weeks. So let's have a little chat. What about this question? We've, we were doing one plus one last week, or one plus two. Let's do one plus two. And we might write it in a C-like language here, int x equals x one plus two. How are we going to do this on the CPU? How does this relate to the, the gates and all the stuff that we looked at last week? You folks tell me, tell me in the chat, someone tell me, how does this work relate to the gates? How do we use this in our CPU? How do we do this operation? I suppose that we could have a circuit with, I suppose we're in a four bit world, it could just have four lines with the one on the right, the, the rightmost, leastmost bit, always set to a high voltage and the other one set to a low voltage. And whenever we needed a one, we could connect those four wires into our CPU. Would that be sensible? No one's jumping in and making great suggestions. I'm just going to think of dumb, wrong answers. Um, we could have a full adder and with a lot of switches connected to it. And when you wanted to turn turn this, the, the inputs to your ALU to be one and two, then little arms inside your CPU turn the switches on for certain wires connected to it. Someone says, send instructions to the ALU to add one and two. Oh, all right, great. Send instructions to the ALU to add one and two. Wow, that's, that's great, but how? How are we gonna do that? What does the instruction have to say to tell the ALU to add one and two? Silence. It's just like a lecture. It's just like the old days. No one answering me. Back in the old days when we used to lecture in person, I had this big square microphone. And if people were being too quiet, I'd just say, oh, pick you, and I'd throw the microphone at them. So if they were ready, they'd catch it. And if they weren't ready or they were looking at Facebook, they'd forget. They would get hit in the face. <laughs> it only happened a few times. Um, ooh. There's a great, a few great suggestions. It'll, so the, okay, the instructions of the ALU should include the operation and it should include a one and a two. That's a really great idea. So we could have some way of encoding an operation, some, some way of saying this has to be addition, not, not and or 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 shift. And then inside the rest of that instruction, we'd put one and two. Someone else is saying, can the compiler just do it and send an instruction to load three? Well, that's a that's a, a workaround, isn't it? Um, in this case, maybe the compiler could do it because it'll never change. But if we had to just say int x equals y plus z, where those latter two integers could could be one and two, or they could be something else, um, we, the compiler won't be able to do the work for us. The compiler can't do everything. Sometimes the the CPU actually has to do some work. Someone said, "What about moving one and two to different registers?" and then say, add those two registers together. That's getting pretty good. Load the int integers into registers and then use the add 
on ALU until there's no carry bit. That's a great idea as well. Probably if we have one and two, I don't think we're going to have any carry bit in, in issues. Use the registers to store the numbers, then add it and output the answer into another register. Ooh, that is starting to get pretty close. We could store these numbers in two registers. Then we could point the ALU to those registers and say, I need you to get the number from uh, um, one register there, another register there, add them together. The, num the output we're going to put into a different register. And then there's another idea of saying, well, we're going to make a variable int x. We're going to do that. The compiler might do that for us. And then the register is going to send, or the ALU should send the output to that address. That's a really good idea. Um, taking the ALU's output, sending them directly into memory. That would be very convenient, wouldn't it? Would be very convenient. Load one and two in two registers, send them to the ALU with some instruction code for addition, good idea. Then store the resulting output in the third register. Okay, great discussion. We've had a number of really, really interesting ideas there. Not all of them are compatible. Some of them say, oh, we should put the output in a register. Some say we should put the output in memory. Some say that the instruction should contain the numbers that we're adding. Some say that the instruction could ju should just say, go to these registers to get the data. Someone was even saying the compiler can do all this for it and just load three in the register. We don't have to deal with it. All of these are really great ideas. And in many ways, they're all, you're all correct. <laughs> because sometimes all of these ideas have been tried in different ways. And we're going to talk about different ways that a CPU can do simple operations like this. Is there a difference between registers and the memory? There is a difference between registers and memory. There is a difference. Is the former more part of RAM than memory? No. To quote the IT crowd, a famous show from about 2007, memory is RAM. <laughs> um, breaking it down, there are three steps to get here. This is the way we're going to explore today. Three steps. We're going to get one into a register. We're going to get two into another register. Then we're going to tell the ALU to put these things together and put the result into a final third register, an output register. And in fact, in fact, I'm here to tell you today that with the microbit CPU, there is no way to get the ALU to put the result directly into memory. Registers are not the same as memory. We'll go into more detail about how memory works in next week, which is all about memory operations. Act more normal, no more talk of memory or RAM. <laughs> Okay, tell the ALU to add them and put the result in another register. Here's how it works in assembly code. The first time we've seen any assembly in this course. Great day. First bit, movs r0, comma 1. Move a 1 into r0. Movs r1, comma 2. Move a 2 into r1. And then we're going to add them together. Add z, adds, add s, r2, r0, r1. And we're going to learn something today about how assembly code works. Usually, oops, the output register in assembly is going to be first. That's the output. We're moving something to R0 out. That's the output, moving something to R0. This is the, after the first comma, there'll be input. Inputs are 1, and the inputs, both inputs are R0 and R1. So... Just to be clear to start with, it's kind of backwards when you're reading assembly, backwards compared to English. Because I would say in English, move a 1 into R0, and I have the, the output at the end. But when I write the assembly instruction, it's movs R0, 1. That's sort of the, the way people like to represent talking to computers often, is this sort of backwards notation. Like in Star Trek, when Captain Picard says, T Earl Grey Hot. If we normally wanted a cup of, cup of hot Earl Grey tea, we'd probably say it in that, that order. But when you're talking to a computer, tea Earl Grey hot. There are only 16 registers. How can we sum up 17 numbers? Whoa. You guys come up with these questions which just blow my mind. I love it. You, you take the information I've given you, you immediately cleverly find the weak point in the information I've given you, the frame of 
what I've given you and uh, start asking mind-blowing questions. How do you add up 17 numbers? You can't with 16 registers. You can't do it. You'd have to use an algorithm that would store your numbers in memory, grab them one by one or group by group, and add them up. You wouldn't just be able to add them together um, straight as registers. In fact, in this course, I think you'll find that you can, you can do a lot with 16 registers, but you can't do everything. You need to do, use memory. It would hurt a lot more if we were working in an older CPU design which has only a couple of registers, only two general purpose registers. Yeah, people are saying arrays. Yeah, great ideas. After the two registers are added, are they going to be deleted? Let's find out in a minute. We're going to do a demo. That's a really excellent question. Let's do it for reals. Here we go. I got my micro bit plugged in. Demo time. Lecturing from slides is boring. This is my favorite thing to do in lectures is to do little experiments with you in ARM assembly. Okay, this is the same screen as you would have. The same, I'm gonna delete that, don't need that today. The same template code as you often have in your labs. And we're gonna add those two registers. Movs are zero, one. Movs are one, two. Adds R2, R1, R0. Okay, that is going to define R2 is defined to be R1 plus R0. R1 defined to be 2. R0 defined to be 1. Everything I'm putting here after, a, after an at symbol is a comment. I'm just commenting each line just so you know what's going on. Let's run it on a disco board. Not a disco board. Stop thinking like it's 2020, Charles. It is a micro bit. This is all good. We've compiled our program. We're debugging. It's the breakpoint is set here, ready to go. And I can press the down button, step down button to see what happens inside my micro bit. Now I've got over here the, the Cortex registers tab. And this gives us kind of a, an insight into the, the number stored in every register in our processor. So I've got R0 all the way up to R12, then the mysterious and charismatic SP, LR, and PC, then the also doubly mysterious and charismatic expressor, and then some other stuff which we don't really cover in the course. <laughs> all this interesting, cool stuff. We're going to deal with these, these ones, the main Rs. Move down and run the first instruction. We haven't run it yet. We just run NOP. NOP is a real instruction. It means no op, nothing. Just, just spin the CPU for one cycle and don't do anything. We're going to run MOVs, MOV1 into R0. And there's a 1. It appears. It works. Woo, so far so good. OK, we'll put 2 in R1. Great. We put 2 in R1. There it is. And now we're going to add them together. Adds R2, R1, R0. OX3. We did it. 1 plus 2. Last week we spent a whole week doing 1 plus 1. Now folks we've done 1 plus 2. You can pat yourself on the back. Let's, let's answer a few questions when we're up here. Someone said when after the two registers are added are they going to be deleted? Let's find out. They have been added and it looks like they have not been deleted. So we can, we can know for sure that those two registers have not been deleted. Doesn't matter if R1 and R0 are in any particular order. Let's find out. I'll rewrite the program. R0, R1. Same dealio. Build it again. One, two. Answer is three. Looks like it doesn't matter. You can put them in any order. Can you also do something like add R1, R0, R1? Put the output back into the same register. Let's give it a go. Adds R0, R0, R1. We'll build and debug again. Whoop. Put one in the first register, two in the second register, and add them together. Bam! You can certainly do that. You can just you can treat one of those registers you're using for input as the output register, and it will be very happy to do that for you. 
Ooh, does assembly code need further compiling? We talk about that later in the lecture, very good question. What's the difference between mov and movs, add and adds? We talk about that later in the, in the, in the lecture. It doesn't mean it's signed. It doesn't mean signed. It means set flags. S for set. It means set flags. Okay. Well, we've, we've done a demo. I'm just going to stop that here and we'll get back to some boring slides. Talk about a few more things and see how we go. I want to go into some more detail. What does it mean when we are doing ads? R D R N R M. This is a kind of a way of representing a instruction in assembly code generically, like giving a, a prototype for what it should look like. RD could be any particular register. RN is a different register and RM is a different register. So the add instruction or the add s instruction, let's, let's be precise here, the adds instruction is encoded into this 16-bit value. Lower bits at the, the right-hand side, higher bits at the left-hand side. 0001, 100, MMM, NNN, DDD. Okay, what does this mean? Someone says, does assembly have documentation? Can you see that I've got many tabs open? I'm going to use these tabs today to explain documentation shortly. Let's just, just bear with me. We'll just look at how, what this assembly instruction is. This first part is the operation code, the op code. And that's the bit which is telling the micro bit what to do with this instruction. Telling the, the, the ALU that this needs to be an add between two values, putting a, an output into a different value. So we call that the op code. That's that first eight bits, or seven bits, sorry. Five, six, seven, yeah. The other parts, M and D, are the arguments. So RM, that's this argument, isn't it? MM, NNN, that's this argument. And DDD is this last argument here. Now, does anyone want to hazard a guess about how we represent so R0 or R1 or R2 in one of those arguments? Oh, binary. Someone's jumped in with a, a very good answer. Let's go to the next slide and find out. Here we go. Here's an example of how to do it. Supposing we've got our original line of assembly we did before. R2, R0, R1. Here RD is R2, RN is R0, and RM is R1. And what we need to do is represent them just like, just like we said in binary. So these three is going to be, that's R1, so we need that to be 1, 0, 0. NNN is R0, that can be 0, 0, 0. And DDD, King DDD is a character in Kirby's Dreamland. O, 1, O. Sorry, my, my, for some reason my pencil doesn't work over here. I don't quite know what's going on there. It's got like a smaller square. I'll need to do a bit of, ah. Uh, yeah, okay, something about my screen being like that. The pixel shrinking or something. No, now it's smaller. Okay, that should get me, whoops. Okay. So we've got the number of the register represented in binary in our instruction. So that one's R2, this one's R0, sorry for my terrible R, and that one's R1. And all of this means adds. Got it? How does this work with the, with the ALU? How does it all fit together? Well, our opcode, that much, 
that's really like looks like something like that. Remember that the ALU we had here was a toy ALU, just a, a representation of what one would be like. And we're not really putting AI, BI into here. We've probably got some other um, mechanism, some other machine which is connected to the, the registers and it is saying, please connect R1 to the output or the output should go into R1. Oh, that's CI, result goes into the correct bit of R1 and these two are going to be connected by the register selection machine and put into those two inputs. The ALU is only a toy, it was just a, a, a demonstration, but you can see how these things start to fit together. The binary numbers are taken from the register and put into AI and BI and there'll be some machine which knows how to select the right register based on this information given in the instruction and based on the, the opcode which is saying that this is an add instruction using registers. Now, there's someone, something happened in the chat. Someone said, wait a minute, can the micro bit execute um, assembly code? No, it can't. It can only execute instructions represented in binary like this. That's a CPU instruction for the CPU on your micro bit. And we call this machine code because the micro bit is a machine and it's code that the machine can understand. And all of these ones and zeros in the machine code, they're not really meant to be parsed by a human or read by a human. They're meant to set wires to be high voltage or low voltage and set the me mechanism into a certain state to do something. So it's very mechanical at this stage. They're, they're pushing little, little values up and down connected to logic circuits. Assembly code is meant for humans to read and write. So it's possible, we could be possibly just write things in machine code, but it would be just awful to try to understand it. And some people say, oh, it's awful to try to understand assembly anyway. Well, it's a lot easier to read assembly than it is to read machine code. And also, assembly code gives us a little bit of flexibility. We can have a little bit of cleverness in the program, the assembler, that goes from assembly code to machine code to help us humans get things right um, without having to remember too many binary numbers. So I said this word assembler, the assembler. What did I mean by that? Well. Assembly assembler, it's a very overloaded term in computer architecture. It can mean three things. Assembler or assembly can mean the human readable code, the assembly code. For instance, that, that line we read before. It can mean a program for encoding the human readable statement into the binary machine code, the ones and zeros. This is, what, this is what I said when I meant an assembler, a program that turns assembly code into ones and zeros. It can also mean the process of that happening. You're assembling some code into machine code. There's some people getting their minds blowing right now, talking about how, how, um, talking about how we're controlling what the computer actually does. There's another few folks starting to get their minds blown saying, hey, wait a minute, if we can only use, if we've only got three digits to represent our assembly instruction, oh, wait a minute, what's that gonna do? That's not gonna work. That can only represent seven different <laughs> registers. We got, we can only do, we could do R0, R1, R2, R3, R4, R5 and R6 and R7. Eight actually. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. But we've got like R11, so how are we gonna do that? Well, we'll get to that in a minute. We'll get there in a minute, maybe. So the assembler, assembler is a program turning your code from assembly code into machine language. 
Now this is where I'm going to talk for the first minute about tool chains. And the tool chain we use in this course is a collection of tools for compiling code called the GNU compiler collection and the GNU bin utils. Bin utils means binary utils. Utilities that can work with binary code. There are lots of different is ASM the acronym for assembly? It is. ASM is often called means assembly. Is assembly code tailored for specific physical chip? Totally is. Yeah, assembly code is, well, there are different types of assembly code for different architectures. And we'll talk about this term called an instruction set architecture. So a different, different manufacturers, different brands of chip have different um, approaches to how to design the instructions. They set up an architecture for their instruction set, and then there'd be a different type of assembly. What we're doing here is called ARM, ARM assembly, ARM v7 assembly, in fact. It's different from Intel x86 assembly. It's different from ARM v8 assembly, different from ARM v6 assembly, a little bit. It's similar to many other types of assembly. They're all similar, but they don't have exactly the same features. So the assembly is going to be a little bit different. But it's not as widely varying as programming languages because the assembly is doing a very simple job. It really, each line of assembly has an instruction, it has some arguments, and that's it. It doesn't have any, there's no like if then else or functions or anything in the assembly language itself. You have to define those things in the computer by yourself. We'll talk about that concept a bit later of what it means to define things by yourself. So we use the GNU bin utils, but GNU tool chain, and I can show you where they are because you've all got a comp twenty dot comp twenty three hundred um, folder in your computer. Here's my computer. I got my 2300, 2022 microbit template repository. I'm just gonna go to dot comp twenty three hundred. This is the tool chain that was installed when you run install tool chain in VS Code. It's got three things, disco server, that's the emulator. OpenOCD is the uh, debugging tool which connects to your micro bit, open on chip debugger. And then arm none EABI is a folder containing all of the tool chain, the compiling and assembling tool chain. And here are the things that it comes with. These are all programs that are run. A few important ones here, we got AS, that's the assembler. It can go from assembly language to machine code. Another important one is GCC, the GNU C compiler or GNU compiler collection. Another important one is obj copy. That turns, helps us turn your assembly code into readable code. Actually, there's a little bit of a, a lie here. You'd think we would be using AS to compile, to turn your code into machine code. But actually in the repos we use GCC. Um, there's a slightly complicated reason for that, but the C, the uh, regular C compiler is quite happy to turn assembly programs into machine code without using AS, but it's just a little bit smarter and it can get us out of trouble sometimes. So it makes life a little bit easier to use GCC rather than AS. But you can definitely use AS. I'll give you a demo in week six about tool chains, but I just wanted to make you aware None of this stuff is magical. It is all, they're all programs that exist on your computer. So here's a thought. Registers are just like variables, right? Discuss with your neighbor. Someone tell me about a register being like a variable. I'm going to take a little break for my voice um, just for five minutes. So to come back and tell me about or leave in the chat, registers are just like variables. Tell me the difference between registers or variables or the similarities. I'll be back in a few seconds. Whoops. Someone's just asked the first great questions. Well, what are variables anyway?
I'm back. Ooh. Someone says variables are like a box that you put a value in. Oh, that's a great idea. A box you put a value in. Variables, registers are definitely like that idea of a variable. Someone says registers are variables. Yeah, something, okay, well we can only have, someone said, wait a minute, we can only have 12 registers. But we can have as many variables as we need. Someone says registers are like the variables in Python that can be changed and don't save anything for a long time. Someone else says it's more like memory. I guess they're suggesting that maybe the, um, the variables are more like memory. Registers are like variables because you can assign and store a value to it. Well, it definitely you can assign a value and store it. That's right. Someone's saying more like RAM. I think they might mean memory is more like RAM. Is that right? Someone's saying registers can take variables. Someone's saying registers are like boxes. Variables are like things you put into the box. Hmm. Temp memory. Um, Unstable memory? Yeah, some really interesting ideas. These don't have types. Someone says, well, variables have types. Int, str, car, float, double. Maybe, maybe variables definitely have types, but registers don't. Very good point. Maybe they have just one type, and that is OB. Someone's saying, are they unstable? Hmm, yeah, good, good question. Someone's saying on Twitch there's another conversation about variables having types in some paradigms. Yeah, I might, might just ask the Twitchers to join me on in the Teams chat. I know it's a bit annoying to have like multiple chats going on, but if you're on Twitch chat, I mean you can you can send memes on Twitch chat if you want to do memes there. I'm totally happy with it, um, and I love your your input, but I don't see it in the lecture. I just I'm looking at the Teams chat. <laughs> Because there are some of our students who can't access um, Twitch because of where they live, so um, everyone can access Teams. Variables are an abstraction. Oh, yeah. So here's the way to think about registers and variables. Registers can be used like a variable, but they're not a variable. And I think that the problem with them the main issue is that they're limited, right? You, can, you only have 12, and you might want more than 12 variables. And really, the concept of a variable is a little bit more abstract than what assembly programming can cope with. A, a variable is a label for something, right? A label for a, a place where you store data. And when you're programming in a high-level programming language, you don't really care where that data is. As long as the, as long as it, is there when you need it, right? You call the variable or you use the variable in a statement. As long as it still contains the number you put in it before, you're happy. And you let this program called the compiler, which is going from a high level programming language all the way into machine code. The compiler is, has the job of making sure that that, that variable is kept safe in between its assignment and its use and that it's, um, not lost, and that it is allowed to be assigned, and that it's allowed to be retrieved later. And if something goes wrong in that process, the compiler is supposed to give you an error. But in assembly programming, you don't have a compiler to look over your shoulder like this. It's your responsibility as the programmer. And this is, <laughs> this is one of the times in this course where I'm going to start saying, your responsibility. Many times in, in assembly programming, you have to take responsibility for how a computer works, how your computer works. You don't get the compiler to, to do a lot of work for you, putting things in registers, moving them in and out of memory, making data structures, creating function structures. There's a lot of stuff that compilers do on our behalf. We don't get that when we're writing an assembly. You have to do it if you want these things. So yeah, you can, you can definitely use registers as variables, but you're going to have the problem that if you need more than 12 of them, you don't have enough. Um, so there's, there's certainly algorithms, things you can do with less than 12 variables, but you may run out one day. Someone else asked about this kind of unstable thing. 
that's something we talk about a little bit later, but yeah, it can happen if you are writing some complex assembly code and you go into a, a, another part of your code, it might need to use the, the registers as well. So you have to have some way of dealing with the fact that other parts of your code might need registers that you're using. So if you say, let R0 be A, well, that's great, but your other code doesn't know about it being A. That's, you have to remember that. So if you want to run other code that also needs R0, you have to put A somewhere else. So that, that whatever data that was that was inside the variable, inside the register, I mean. Blah. Okay, back to our one plus two program. The adds register, adds lets us get the numbers into the registers, but how do we get numbers into the program? Any, any numbers at all? Well, here's this other, um, this other command, the movs instruction, M-O-V-S, and the version of movs we're using right now, or we're looking at, has one argument, which is a register, RD, here it is over here, one, two, three, and it has one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight bits dedicated to a number. That's cool, isn't it? And we often use the this pound sign or hash sign, not to mean a hashtag on Twitter or a channel on Teams, but to mean a decimal number in, um, in assembly language. Someone's saying, what about garbage collection? Would you need to do that too? I don't even know what garbage collection, like if I'm the CPU, I don't know what garbage collection is. That's like a, a concept of high level programming languages. The CPU is just like running ads. When is it supposed to do garbage collection? You have to do garbage collection. You have to take out your own garbage. Yeah, and it's de definitely garbage. GC is about minimizing memory usage, right? Or it's about making sure that when you need memory later, you have it. Um, does that really matter when you're using the memory for one thing? If, you, if you're doing, I guess the difference is who's responsible for it. In assembly programming and, and programming with the C programming language as well, one step above, <laughs> you could say, you the programmer are responsible for cleaning up your memory after you use it. But we're not talking about memory today. We're only talking about registers. So here is our move instruction. Here's the opcode, 00100. There's the register um, argument, and here is our immediate value. So this is great. It, this, this design lets us put a number inside an instruction. Whoops. Uh, where is my Visual Studio code? So we're encoding a number. We more correctly have a, hat, a pound there. Have a number encoded inside the instruction. Cool. Ooh, someone said, what about, we've got eight digits for a number. What if we want a data typed long or floating points? Well, we're gonna to have to do something else. We can't do that here. We can't get every number in the world fitting into eight bits, can we? Um, there are some tricks about how that works. I'll have to get into it a little bit later with you, but it's not just the first um, the first 256 numbers. That would be very limiting, but you get a selection of useful numbers that you can put in. You definitely get the first lo the low ones. So if you're just using small numbers, you can always use this operation, but there's some numbers if you put in, it's like, mm, can't, can't do that. It doesn't work. <laughs> and the, the assembler will tell you. All right, give me a little pop quiz. If this is the move instruction, what does this instruction do? What is that instruction? So where's the opcode? I'll do it too, and you can um, tell me if I'm doing it wrong. There's the immediate value, there's RD. 
Oh no, my head blocks some binary. No, that's going to be block it more. Here we go. Move the number. Okay, someone's giving me an answer, so I'm just going to start working it out. That's R0, that would be R2. It's going to be R4. And what have we got here? 1 plus 4 plus 8. Yeah, MOVs are for 13. Cool, okay, well, that's great. I wonder what this would be in... Um, in hex, that's going to be 0. 13 is going to be A, B, C, D. D. O one oh one oh it's gonna be four O one oh it's gonna be two. Should we see if this actually compiles into our program? Moz R four thirteen. Now oh, I hope it works. Now you'll do this in your in your lab, but I'm going to do view disassembly. So in VS Code, you can compile it. We've put it on our micro bit, and now I'm going to uncompile it so that we can see what what the memory actually contains. I'm just going to do the this function, and what did I say it was going to be? Whoops. In hex, it would be two four o d o x, and then in memory, I get movs r four number thirteen o d two four. Oh, what's going on there? That's confusing, isn't it? We talk about this in more in more detail in a later lecture, but it's Things get stored backwards in in uh, in memory. So the lower byte, the lower eight bits goes first, and then the higher eight bits. OD twenty four. So the the machine code there was two four OD, and it's stored in memory as OD two four. Another little cool demo. Right, you might that might have just been too much, but. We get to deal with that. Should we write 5 or hash 5? It doesn't actually matter. In The assembler is smart enough to know what you mean either way. Um, the, someone's just said, what does this mean? That means uh, decimal number. I think it does anyway, maybe it just means immediate. But we don't have to write them there, we can get rid of them. Oops, it's in read only, that's the, the editor. It works just fine this way. So, how do you know which instructions you can use? What are the possible instructions in the world. Someone says it's because of little endianness. That's why the 2-4 and the OD were swapped. But we're talking about instructions. What instructions are possible? We need, to, we need to know why. What instructions are possible? That's determined by the instruction set architecture. I talked, talked about that before. So when people design a CPU, they work out an instruction set that are going to work, and that is set up for life with that CPU. It's designed to use these certain instructions um, because it's related to the way that the hardware is wired up inside the CPU. The instruction set architecture also defines registers, some stuff about memory, 
um, a lot of things about how this CPU works. And the good thing is that usually there are a lot of different CPUs that have the same kind of instruction set. That's how you can run a, compile a program on one computer, pick up the program, put it on another one and run it and it'll still work because both computers are using the same instruction set. Now we're going to talk about what CPU is in your micro bit. I said it was a, a CPU by a company called Nordic Semiconductor. But now I'm going to tell you that it's also a CPU by a company called ARM or ARM. And it's a little bit of a trip to realize how ARM CPUs work. ARM makes designs for CPUs. They don't make actual CPUs. They just make the design, the ISA and the, the design of the CPU. Other companies make the CPUs um, to that design. In fact, many companies make them. This is different than Intel and AMD, the other CPUs that you might have in your desktop or laptop, where Intel make Intel CPUs, AMD make AMD CPUs, and that's it. So if you've got an Intel CPU, it was made by Intel. ARM CPUs might be made by many manufacturers that put their own stuff in them. They can change them in various ways. They obviously don't want to change them too much because they still want people to be able to use them with the typical ARM um, development tools. But the particular type of CPU in, in the, the micro bit is called a Cortex-M4. So Cortex is a line of CPUs, kind of like i7, like a, a, a marketing name for a, a collection of CPUs. And the M4, all the M processors are small energy efficient ones for use in microcontrollers. And the M4 is a pretty big, kind of powerful MCU processor. There's, there's old ones, the M3 was an old version. There's a much smaller um, processor called an M0 or a simpler processor. And in fact, the old Microbit 1.5 used a Cortex M0, so it's quite different. The Cortex M4 is quite an advanced microcontroller um, processor. And there are many, many chips that use a Cortex M4. In fact, the discovery board that we used last year also has a Cortex M4 made by a different manufacturer called ST Semiconductor. Oh yeah, Julian, thank you, Julian Crosby, for correcting me. The pound sign, this sign, that equals M uh, immediate. That means that there is going to be a value encoded into the instruction. And it's usually not re required. It's usually optional. Uh, and someone's saying some Intel assemblers need the pound signs there. We use the GNU assembler here in this class. There are many other assemblers that you might have to use in the world. Often when people buy, uh, particularly for embedded um, equipment, the manufacturer of the MCU might also supply the tools um, so you'd get some kind of random download that you have to install with weird software that only works on Windows or something to, to actually get your program onto the MCU. And we're very lucky. We live in a, a paradise where we can just use the open source GNU tools and do everything on, um, in an open source way on all platforms and be very happy. So thank goodness we don't have to use special manufacturer specific tools. Now, what about this Cortex M4? How do we know what that works uses? We know that it uses the ARM V7M ISA. All of the Cortex M series processors use that, so we actually can go into the manual for that ISA to find out how these things work. Someone said, Adam saying I'm hyping GNU. No, I'm not hyping GNU. I'm just hyping the fact that it's great to not have to use things that are made by manufacturers and are terrible. <laughs> terrible for the user and hard to learn with whereas the the GNU toolchain is easier for everyone to install and easier to deal with I'm not going to go on a GNU crusade here here's this this manual I just remember what page I'm on I don't want to forget that page a7191 okay the ARM v7m architecture reference manual now this wonderful document 
is going to explain all about the, the instruction set architecture, and I expect you all to have memorized the entire thing by next week. That was a joke. It's very long. How long is it? 916 pages. It's a very long book. You don't absolutely don't have to memorize this. It's a reference manual. That means that you refer to it when you need specific information. But one of its really cool, cool, I just called a manual cool. It just shows the kind of nerd I am. One of the interesting things about this manual is that it contains a alphabetical list of all of the ARM B7M instructions. And now we can find out how I knew what the instruction was going to be for ADDS ads. I can go here to, whoops, add. This is A7.7.4. Sorry, it's small on the, on the left-hand side of the screen. I'll make it bigger in the middle. Um, <clears throat> Uh, does ARM stand for Architecture Reference Manual? No, um, I've forgotten what it stands for. It used to stand for something. It's the name of a company, right? It, it doesn't have to stand for anything. This is the definition of this instruction, add with registers. Add adds a register value and an optionally shifted register value and writes the result to the destination register. It can optionally update the condition flags based on the result. And here's two different encodings that are useful. Here's the encoding we looked at that has three operators, three operands. And we were using the, the, uh, the S version, although it has no difference in this particular encoding. Oh, maybe, how does it do that? Oh well, ADD register, I'm sure someone will tell me. Oh, here's the, the S version maybe. Or well, maybe we were using this one, the not S version. Here's a version that has three operands and you can see they only get three bits for each register. Here's a version that has two operands and you can see that it's got four bits for that one and three bits for this one. And it's a bit more complicated. You can see that we need maybe a few different encodings or different instructions on the CPU for the same idea because adding two numbers together is um, an idea which is used a lot and in different circumstances using different kinds of numbers, immediates or registers, we need to have different encodings. Then we've got the version of this chip, uh, this instruction, which just uses the, um, uses immediates. It adds an immediate to that register and stores it in the same register. So there's lots of different versions of add and some of them, sometimes we get to choose which version we want, but sometimes the assembler will make that choice based on the, um, the arguments we've, that we've provided. Okay, that's all I'm going to say about the ISA for the moment. Um, how do you find out what instructions are available? Don't go in the ISA to read what instructions are available. You should be looking at the COMP2300 cheat sheet, a very important piece of information. And I'm going to say that there's two versions here that I really think are good. This one is a PDF. They're on different pages, for, uh, which is a bit confusing. I'll try to fix that later. But there's a PDF that you can print out, keep close to your heart, put it onto your pillow when you sleep at night and learn how all these things work. We'll go through this a bit more on Thursday, I think. The very first one is add, so that's good if you need to know about add. And then there's another version which, um, you know, Julian in the chat was working on earlier this month, which is the HTML version of it. And this is probably going to be more useful because you, these days you often will want to be looking at this cheat sheet while you're in a lab or something, and it has all the same information. Here's 
the syntax for the add command. Here's what it does. There's lots of other idea, lots of other commands here, subtraction, multiplication, division, and you can see that for each one, there's actually lots of different versions because there's different things we might need to do. Logical operations and BIC, you don't know what that is, but it's A and not B, or not or not, exclusive or, yep. Oh uh, yeah, so it was it was Julian and, and Ben Gray who did a lot of work to make this a really nice nice HTML um, thing. It was mov and there's mov s, two things together or with the immediate. And then there's some other stuff which we'll deal with later. <laughs> Great. Okay. The Comp2300 cheat sheet. That is your friend. That is what you really want to be spending a lot of time with, getting to understand the cheat sheet. It helps you to understand which, oper which instructions to use in different situations. So here's an, an example. Add everything in the curly brackets there is optional. So curly bracket S, optional S at the end. Talk about what that means later. Then some other stuff that might go after there, which is could also be optional argument values. Then we've got an optional register here, then at least two operands, and then an optional number of shift things, numbers to shift. We'll talk about this stuff later, but I guess an important thing right now is that there's at least two different versions of add that you might see all the time. Add with two, with three operands, which works the way we did it before, and add with two. And this one means R0 defined equal to R0 plus R1. It makes more sense when you try it out. Why have I got two? Oh yeah. There's two little extra optional suffixes which you can add to your instruction, add to add, these ones C and Q, and then there's an extra um, somewhat interesting um, operand right at the end which is going to be denoted by shift. So these first, this first one, add C, you can put things into that suffix, replace it with other values, EQ or any, under certain circumstances, which we'll go through a bit in week four, about how to make it con a conditional add. So only add under some conditions. You can also say, I want this to be a 32-bit instruction or a 16-bit instruction, if there's some particular reason to want to do that. And you can also say that I want the value in RM to be shifted, logical shifted, by a certain amount before it's um, used. Handy stuff. If you don't understand what it means though, don't worry right now. This is a little bit a little bit extra just to, to get your get you in the feeling about what these words mean on the slightly complicated cheat sheet. So sometimes when you're dealing with assembly there are parts of the the parts of the instruction which are optional. Maybe some arguments are optional. Maybe some parts of the front are optional. It doesn't necessarily mean that those bits are missing. It might mean that some registers are reused. It might mean that um, there's some bit which is set to zero or one, depending on what you've put in there. So the encoding is always gonna be the full narrow or short um, wide encoding. Basically, this is a syntax which you, you learn to use by using it. So in our labs, you'll be presented with some little experiments and tasks to do that require you to get into the cheat sheet, understand some of these instructions, and try them out in different ways. And by doing that, you will learn how they work, and the, the cheat sheet will start to make sense. 
it certainly is a bit scary the first time you see it. I remember the first time I saw that cheat sheet and I was like, what am I teaching? <laughs> That's a lot. <laughs> what did I sign up for? All right. Now there's, uh, I guess we're talking about ISAs now. This is the, the, the design for a set of instructions. And I said before that there are several different manufacturers that create different chips. They use different kinds of ISAs. And I mentioned a few in manufacturers, Intel, um, AMD, then ARM just designs the ISA and the chip designs. Other companies like Nordic or ST make them, or Qualcomm, or what's the other one for the Broadcom? That's the Raspberry Pi chip is Broadcom. The, um, If you start looking up ISAs on Wikipedia, you'll start to see this word RISC and another word called CISC. And these are kind of more historically oriented ways of understanding different styles of writing an ISA. There was one style was got to be popular where you just keep adding more and more instructions and the instructions would be really long and complicated. Um, that was the eventually became known as complex instruction set computing. Your instructions could be complicated. And then at some point, like in the 80s or even earlier, some computer scientists said, no, 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 no. We should make this so that the instructions themselves are quite simple and the programmer has to, or the compiler has to use more instructions to accomplish the same thing. And that was called reduced instruction set computing. Um, and ARM the R in ARM actually stands for the R in RISC, the Reduced Instruction Set Computing Machine. That was their concept. Um, it was a RISC designed process, the original ARM processors, which is the, the ancestor of the ones that we use today. Um, the, the processors in your laptop and desktop, provided they're Intel or AMD, they're likely to be the, ancestor, the descendants of CISC, CISC processors. They use an instruction set called x86, um, which is a monstrously big and complicated instruction set architecture because it's got, it has um, compatibility going all the way back to the original Intel desktop chips. The ARM architecture, they were kind of more brutal and saying, no, we're not compatible with previous binaries. We're making a new version Old binaries aren't compatible. The new version is doing its own thing. Um, if you have to want, if you want code to run on the new system, you have to compile it again. And right now, there might be a few of you who are looking at your computer on, looking at this lecture on a new computer bought from Apple. Um, if you bought a computer from Apple in the last two years, very likely it has an ARM chip in it. It's using the ARM um, ISA. Not the same ISA as the MCUs use. They, they're using the, the more advanced laptop level, iPad, iPhone level processors. Apple manufactures them or they have a manufacturing partner and they do the redesign from the ARM ISA. So the Apple computers have some kind of special clever programming that allows them to use old binaries compiled for x86 um, CPUs and run them in, in a modern um, Apple environment. Anyway, that's just, it's really a historical note about RISC and CISC. We talked about different width of instructions. You'll see this a little bit in, um, in your lab this week, but actually the instructions that we looked at so far as examples were all 16 bits wide, but you can also have a 32 bit wide instruction in ARM that's allowed and the registers are always 32 bits. So that's how that works in ARM. So many things here. We've talked about a lot of stuff. ARM, Cortex-M, Thumb2, that's the name of the, the instructions set for, for Cortex-M processors. Uh, there's a lot of these different words to understand. It's a whole ecosystem of terminology about how CPUs work and it's understandable if it's a bit mind boggling today, but bear with us. These things will make sense as the course goes along and I guess one of the problems is it's hard to explain everything all at once. 
but we will get back in lectures and particularly in your labs and you'll have some time to think carefully about these concepts. And we can drill down on a few more, more items. Um, the reference manual, we had a look at that, all of the instructions and encodings. And we found the MOV instruction, or we should do that in a minute. And that's sort of the end of part one. Um, where is that MOV instruction? They're in alphabetical order in part seven, so I'm going to go down to MOV. MOV immediate. MOV immediate writes an immediate value to the destination register. It can optionally update the condition flags based on the value. Okay, there's MOV, the 16-bit immediate version that we saw in the lecture slide. Here's the wide version, a 32-bit version of basically the same thing. This one gives us a few more bits for the immediate. There's an I there. There's four extra bits here, and there's the eight original bits. And this one gives us 16 in total. Eight there, three there, four there, and an extra one. So there are lots of tricks that the MOV can use to represent different numbers as immediates. We talk a bit about that later. Here's MOVs for moving things from one register to a register. You're allowed to do that too. 16-bit version and a 32-bit version. I haven't seen any, any uh, questions except from Julian who already passed the course and now he's a tutor. So. Ooh, how does this solve the R11 problem from earlier? Well, let's find out. Um, there's a, there's our typical encoding of, of MOV that we talked about before with three bits. Ooh, someone said, what does the conditional suffix mean again? Not sure I got that. You're not supposed to get that yet. Week four is all about conditionals. So I just sort of said, you just put that away in the corner. And we'll talk about conditionals in week four because it's just, it's its own topic. Um, but I would like to talk about the R11 because this is the kind of thing where I'm like, wait a minute, how does it store R11 again? I'm not sure if I, if I remember. I'm going to put... I'm just going to put a knob here and we're going to have one instruction under test or two. We'll put movs are four, one, movs are eleven, one, and we're going to compile this and then decompile and have a look at what it actually did. Okay, so that, we'll just see that it worked. One, one, we got a one in R11. It should have worked. View disassembly of the main function. Ooh. So in the first line, there's our NOP. Remember we had NOP. I don't know what's going on there. We had NOP. Oh, I've got two windows. Handy. We've got a NOP, and then we've got a MOVs R4 R1 and a MOVs R11 one. And these look like they're the same instruction. But over here, We've got movs R41, so far so good. Then movs W R11, one. So we've got a wide version, and you can see over here, this one used two bytes, 16 bits, to store that instruction, and this one's used 32 bits to store the instruction. That's pretty cool. I don't have my mug. I took it to the kitchen to wash it up. Now that is pretty cool. So the assembler has been like, uh huh, you're trying to use R11, eh? Are ya? Well, I'm gonna use the wide version of MOV. Here's the, the 
non-wired version of MOV. That could only give us three bits for the, the register. And here's the wired version. One, two, three, four. So we can go up to <laughs> Assembler is smart. It's smarter than it's both smarter than you think, and it's dumber than you think, or less smart than you think. I could say um, that is pretty cool. So this one can store bigger operands, four bits. Now, here's a question for you, my my curious folks. What's the advantage of not just using wide all the time? Why don't we just use wide all the time? You tell me, why would we not just use wide all the time? I'll sip my water while you're thinking, giving me an answer. The wide operations can do more, can't they? Fast? I don't know about that. Hmm. Someone says it's efficient in some aspect. Well, there are two things about efficiency in computing. Surely you've done this. Two kinds of efficiencies, basic sort of efficiencies. You tell me what they are. Someone said it's, it's computationally expensive. Time and space efficiency. Time and space. So is MOV, the, the short MOV, 16 bits, is that going to be more time efficient or is it going to be more space efficient? Someone's saying time complexity is worse. Um, no one's saying for compatibility. I'm not going to comment on that one. Um, this one is 16 bits wide. This one is 32 bits wide. This one is small in space, and this one is big in space. So that's this is what we know so far. We don't know how many cycles these take, or we haven't discussed it. It's somewhere in the manual, actually, but I've forgotten what page. Um, I think that they probably take the same amount of time. So the time complexity of MOV W and the time complexity of MOV normal is the same. But MOV normal, MOV normal is smaller in space, definitely. We know that for sure. We can see the evidence in front of us. So if this was a trade-off in the design of the ARM ISA, they designed it so that you would be able to have a mix of big instructions and small instructions, the thumb to ISA, and betting that overall you can get a, use enough small instructions to make a real difference in the space of your application. It actually makes it a little bit more time complex um, to have to switch between them, I think, or at the program level, when a big program is compiled, it might have to do some more um, add a few extra instructions to use more small instructions. But it turned out that it was, by ARM's calculation, a good trade-off to make to have this mix of short, narrow, and wide instructions so that, on balance, your programs can be smaller in space. Why do we care if they're small in space? Because we're doing things in embedded processes. All of the program memory has to fit in the flash on this little thing. And it doesn't have a lot of flash. The, the modern ones that we use probably have quite a bit, maybe like a megabyte or something. Like that's a lot. But there are, there are plenty of microcontroller units in the world that only have a few kilobytes of flash memory. So making your program smaller in space turns out to be really useful. So that's why ARM, um, ARM V7M assembly instructions have this um, focus on making them space efficient but they were clever enough to give us ways of using both of getting mostly space efficiency but also having more expressive instructions 
So the problem with the space efficient 16 bit MOV is that it can't do everything we want. Representing R11 isn't possible. Just for the, the, there was someone who was asking, wait a minute, what was the problem with R11? Here is the problem. Our MOV instruction only has three places for the, the register number. So if you want to put R11 in there, you can't. The maximum number is seven. So to, to represent R11, you need an extra bit. So that you can have, what is it? You're gonna have eight and two and one. So this one, only the MOV W instruction has four bits dedicated for the register operand. And the MOV narrow doesn't, only has three. Ah, instead of using the named registers, can you MOV into SP, LR, or PC? Let's try it and find out. MOV SP1. We'll do another one. LR, I don't have it as capitals. I should cancel my previous one, build and compile again, build and debug. Uh oh, something going wrong here. <gasps> it wouldn't let me do something. Normally it lets me do everything. Is it possible to enter this binary code directly somewhere? Um, <laughs> Joshua, you're gonna have a fun lab two, because that is exactly the task you have in lab two, is to directly put in machine code into your, um, into your micro bit. It's gonna be a good lab for you. I'm not gonna do it in front of you because it requires too much brain power and when I'm speaking and, and um, coding and answering questions at the same time, I tend to mess it up. There is no way I would get that right in a live lecture. I know my limits. <laughs> I think it's not gonna let me do this MOVS PC one. Doesn't like that. So I'll just get rid of that one and see if it'll let me do it. Oh, not allowed to do that one. R13 not allowed here. All right, no, we're not allowed to do that one. Okay, comment that one out. All right, so we're allowed to do, we're allowed to do um, MOVs LR1, but we're not allowed to do MOVs into SP. Not allowed, and we're not allowed to do MOVs into PC. You can, you don't know what PC is and you don't know what SP is. They're used for specific, special, important things. And you need to use specific, um, specific instructions to interact with them, which we'll understand as we go through these lectures. I'm loving the, the, um, the great questions here. I'm, I don't know if there's a question I've missed which was really good. Oh, the conditional suffix, we're gonna talk about that another, another day. Someone says, is a chip speed consistent with its design or do different manufacturers differ regardless of the design? It's a manufacturer thing. So, you know, you can buy like a, a just for your desktop PC, you could get different CPUs all made by Intel they have different numbers of uh, different clock speeds, right? So they're just changing. Often they're actually the same, the same silicon. Like some of them, the, the higher rated ones are like the better, the ones that turned out better. So it's, it's hard to explain this, but when they make CPUs, they make a lot of CPUs on a big silicon, big, big bit of silicon. Some of them turn out to be really good and some of them turn out to be not so great. So the, the not so great ones, it turn, usually they can deactivate certain stuff or run it slower and still sell it. The really good ones get to be like the, the super top grade, more expensive CPUs that can be clocked faster, more of their features can be enabled. 
too, is it too early to ask about how to use various inputs and outputs on the micro bit, such as the buttons and lights, by the way? Wow, that's a great question. Is it too early? I wonder if, um, I wonder if we will, if I could do it with what we've got today. The thing is, I think I can't because all of the control over that stuff is through memory. What I can show you is that the what we call the buttons and the LEDs are all controlled by wires we call GPIO, general purpose input output. In fact, some of the GPIO wires are here on the bottom of the of the micro bit. If you want to know what they are, we can have a look over here. Microbit, this is the Microbit website, the De Microbit developer community. If you go to microbit.org, it thinks you're a primary school child wanting to use Scratch to code uh, your microbit, but we didn't want to be, you know, grown up systems programmers, um, comp 2300 slash 6300 students. We need the real stuff. We need tech.microbit.org. So we go and look at the schematics and then we go look at the pin map and all of these different pins. GPIO 2, GPIO 1, button A, button B, it's connecting to a pin called PO23. PO14 is button A. So when you're pressing this button down, button A, the one on the left, it's actually connecting 3 volts to pin O, port 0, pin 14 on the microbit CPU. And we can access these things through memory, and this is where this Cortex peripherals thing comes in. The, the VS Code plugin we use called Cortex Debug knows where all of the peripherals are addressed in memory. How are peripherals addressed in memory, you ask? Uh, just, just accept it for today. <laughs> we'll deal with that memory maps in week three. If we go to, there's GPIOs here somewhere, not GPIO TE, ah, uh, P0. GPIO P0, and the that's the GPIO P0 input register. It's a memory mapped register. And if you press down on A, one of those would actually go to high if it was uh, pin 14, I think it was. That would go to high if it was set up to be a, an input um, pin. So you need to access the memory, use the memory access instructions to turn the lights on and off and access the buttons on the micro bit. And in fact, in this kind of CPU, after a certain point, you need to use memory, memory operations to do almost everything because your main job is to control the peripherals, sense things, or control the output devices, and all that stuff happens through memory operations. Memory is everything in these kind of CPUs. Shall I give, talk about another slide or something? I don't know, I've got 30 more slides to do on, on Thursday. It seems like a lot. Um, instructions part two. I'm gonna do five more minutes of slides just so we know where we're up to. Now, immediate versus register instructions. I think we talked about this a bit. We'll probably revise it next week, but uh, I mean on Thursday. But we've there's definitely are frequently two types of instructions. Ones that are gonna have only register arguments and ones that use some of that space in the instruction encoding for an immediate value. And that's where you need the, the hash sign to give it the um, denote an immediate value. And if you've been looking through the register, you might've seen that some instructions add, mov, have two versions, one for immediate, one for other values. See you later, someone's running off to Comp 2100 lecture. And you've got that for add. Here they are, two different versions. The immediate encoded version and the register encoded version. And they're both equally valid and your assembler knows which one to choose. I don't think we already talked about that. We can talk about it again. I'm just going to skip ahead and see if I really want to do these slides. I think I'll stop here. Someone's probably got another great question for me.
one of you hard question askers jump up and ask a good question. And if I don't know the answer, then Julian will. Or Adam will. Those folks who have Adam as their tutor, you're very lucky because he was the world champion question asker in Comp 2300 in 2020. Um, should we write some more instructions? <laughs> Ooh, Ronan, someone's got a very hard question. Waiting for it. <laughs> Julian, you can, if you ask me a hard question, you'll have to, <laughs> you'll have to do it. You'll have to answer it. We're going to get some other, other instructions in here from the cheat sheet. We did add, add with constant. We'll try one of those, add with a constant. How about that? So add with a constant. I'm just going to use the version without the S, uh, zero, you know, add hmm, seven. Okay, so that should be R zero. I'm putting in nops here just so I can find things in the disassembly. So we've got our add. Uh, whoops. Just two versions of add. One's got an immediate value and one's got register arguments. Oh man, that's a really hard question, Julian. Uh, <laughs> oh, some really good questions. Far out. I'll look at those questions in a minute. I'm just going to... Oh, look at that. We're out of time. See you next week. <laughs> no, we will talk about the questions. We'll just see our program works. I'm not looking at Cortex peripherals right now. Look at the registers. Put one in R0, we'll put two in R1, and then we add R1 and R2, R0 and R1 together. Or no, we're adding R0 to seven. We should get eight as the answer. So far, so good. Now we want to add R0 and R1 together and should put 10 or OA in, or A in R0. There we go, that's 10 in decimal. What's our disassembly look like? These ones both fit in 16 bits, which is pretty cool. So if I look back in my um, architectural reference manual, Look at those two different versions of add. There's the immediate version. There's an immediate version that has two operands, but only a very small immediate. There's an immediate version that has a bigger immediate, but only one operand. And then if we want two operands and a big immediate, there's got to be this 32-bit this wide version. Let's see if I can give it a big number and get it to do the wide version. So close, stop, close that. I don't know what's going to work here. A million. Let's see if it works. No, it hasn't let me do it. Invalid constant. Oh man, not a constant that it can represent. So if you do the wrong thing with adds, it's not going to let you do it. Just to remove some zeros and see if it'll let me. Let's 
still an invalid constant. What about a small one? Okay, that worked. Now we can use our disassembly. Oh, we're still using the, the, the narrow version. Now, a few folks are having a great discussion. We're going to leave it in a minute, but my tutor Julian has asked an amazing question, which is, how does the CPU know whether it's getting a 16-bit instruction or a 32-bit instruction? Because it surely would need to load both halves of it, right? If it just loads the first half and it's a 32-bit instruction, it's not going to work. And I think the answer is in how the small encodings start and how the big encodings start. Let's just see if we can see anything anything worthwhile. I think that this, in these small narrow encodings, this first bit, the highest bit, is a zero, and in the wide encodings, the, the highest bit is always a one. Would that be right? I am um, have to say I've forgotten the answer to this question. It's a really hard one, very good one. But you can see that, I think someone said in the chat, well, the prefixes of the wide instructions, the first, the opcode, is going to say that one's wide and the the opcode for the narrow instruction is going to indicate a, definitely a narrow instruction. They'll be different. A few more. Wide, wide, they start with ones. Oh, there's a narrow one that starts with a one, so I guess we're not right. Our, uh, our proposition was untrue. What about the second bit? That seems to be one in all of these. That was one in that narrow one. Hmm, don't know. Julian can tell me the answer. I've forgotten it. Um, someone's saying, do we need to know about floating point numbers? You actually don't need to know about it for this course. We don't cover floating point numbers. If you want to know how they work, please be my guest to find out and be curious about it. But we don't cover it in the lectures and we don't ask you to do any assessments about floating point numbers. Unless I think of some amazing exam question which you could work out without needing to have done um, any preparation on it. But I probably won't. I am going to call it a day. It is four o'clock. There's our two hour lecture. It's been an exciting one. We've, we've done a few little experiments. We've learned a lot about CPU instructions. We've got a, a bunch more slides uh, on Thursday related to how the flags work in your CPU. So there was a flag called carry and that one's going to be related to the carry out of the adder. But there's other flags that we need to know about all to do with how our understanding of um, unsigned and signed numbers works. So I'll see you folks at 9am Canberra time on Thursday and for now oops I'll see you say, say goodbye. Bye! <laughs>